today, our guest speaker is Dr. Nasiba Ganga from Mayo Clinic, Rochester, US. She will be speaking to us on myeloproliferative neoplasms, a case-based discussion. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group, which is supported by Novartis and managed by Perfect Square. I thank Mr. Bhushan, Slekha, and Rahul, and the team from Novartis for supporting our academic activities. Yash Karpesh and the team from Perfect Square for managing these webinars. The Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group. Our guest speaker, Dr. Nasima Gangat, who has been very kind. This is the second webinar. She's doing it for us in a short period of few months. All our discussions were themselves eminent hematologists, medical oncologists, and you participants for sparing your Saturday evening, afternoon, morning, depending upon which part of the world you're logged in. Tomorrow morning, we have Dr. Nihar Desai from Mumbai speaking to us about venetoclax, and that will be at 11.30 a.m. IST. Our discussions have been displayed here alphabetically. We have Dr. Abhishek Dudatra from Ahmedabad, Ashwari Raj from Ahmedabad, Akshaya Mandloi from Varanasi, Ankit Rayani from Ahmedabad, Dr. Ayan Bhattacharya from Kuch Bihar, Dr. Devdatta Basu from Puducherry, Dr. Giri Punja from Mysore, Dr. Girish Balikai from Harvard, Dr. Karthi Kodupi from Manipal, Dr. Kamil Kumar Patel from Ahmedabad, Dr. Minu Angi from Ahmedabad, Dr. Monica Chenareti from Bangalore, Dr. Nishita Shetty from Mangaluru, Dr. Pujita Bairedi from Hyderabad, Dr. Rajan Yadav from Ahmedabad, Dr. Rakhi Kar from Puducherry, Dr. R. Bala Subramanian from Madurai, Dr. Ravi Kiran from Hassan, Dr. Riya Balikar from Nagpur, Dr. Sushil Selvarajan from CMC Velo, Dr. Rama Devi from GCRI Ahmedabad, Colonel Dr. Uday Yana Mandra from AFMC Pune, Dr. Vidisha Mahajan from Mumbai, Dr. Yashwant Kashya from Raipur, Dr. Yoga Lakshmi from Hyderabad. A few words about our guest speaker, Dr. Nasima Gan. She is a professor of medicine, Division of Hematology, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. She received her medical degree from Aga Khan University, Karachi, followed by internal medicine and hematology training at the Mayo Clinic before joining as faculty way back in 2012. She currently serves as the Education Chair, Division of Hematology and Program Director for the Advanced Hematology Fellowship Program. She was named Teacher of the Year by the Hematology Fellows in 2016, 2020, and 2021. Her clinical research interests are focused on MPM. She has authored or co-authored over 100 papers and key contributors to the MPN field. These include improving prognostication, investigating the connection between mutations and clinical phenotype, and evaluating the novel therapeutics. She has served as Editor-in-Chief of the American Society of Hematology News Daily 2021. She's currently an Associate Editor for Blood Cancer Journal and Editorial Board Member for the American Journal of Hematology. She will lecture today on MPN, a case-based discussion. Over to you. I'm just going to unmute. Sorry, I was muted. And I will share my screen. Yes, perfect. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. It's just that I can only see one half of the screen, which is okay. I'll manage. Well, good evening, everyone. I know it's evening, it's morning, it's different parts of the world. It's a pleasure to be uh, on board this morning to discuss myeloproliferative neoplasms and kind of do a case-based discussion rather than a 
didactic lecture. So what I have done today is brought one of my patient cases on board and then kind of weaved in all the approaches to myeloproliferative neoplasms along with the case. So that should make it more interesting than previous talks. So here are my disclosures. Um, and the outline of my talk today is I'll start off with one of my clinic patients whom I've been following for the last several years, then kind of use the clinic case to go through the diagnostic approach to myeloproliferative neoplasms. My patient actually had polycythemia vera, so I'm going to focus on TB to start off with, go walk through his diagnostic and prognostic approach, go through some of the newer therapeutic approaches in polycythemia vera in particular, and then kind of end to the disease evolution since the patient transformed to myelofibrosis. So we'll kind of go through his management in that aspect, and then we'll kind of have a few concluding points. So my patient is 55 years old when I first saw him um, almost a decade ago. He presented with a hemoglobin of 18.6, hematocrit of 57.9, white count and platelet count were within normal range. He'd had no prior thromboses, but had had a chronic thoracic aortic dissection, which had left him with uh, chronic chest pain, hypotension, so was not the best uh, substrate medically, even though he had never had a true thrombotic event. He had no constitutional symptoms or splenomegaly on exam. So, of course, with his elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit, myeloproliferative neoplasm was in the differential. It was an isolated elevation, but he's not a smoker. There was no other good explanation, no obstructive sleep apnea. So among the myeloproliferative neoplasms, we have three major entities that are unified by the presence of the JAK2 mutation. That's polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, and primary myelofibrosis, which is now subdivided into prefibrotic MF and overtly fibrotic MF. And amongst the JAK2 mutated myeloproliferative neoplasms, PV is marked by the JAK2 mutation in the majority of cases. 98% of the patients harbor a JAK2 mutation. ET and primary myelofibrosis, about two thirds of patients have JAK2 mutation, and the remainder will have calreticular or MIPL mutation, and there will be a fraction of patients, about 10% or so, without any of the mutations, what we call triple negative disease. So if we are suspecting polycythemia vera, the first tests we recommend are peripheral blood testing. JAK2 testing can be obtained on the peripheral blood. We do recommend screening for exon 14 and 12 at the same time, since simultaneous assessment is always easier, even though exon 12 mutations are relatively infrequent, and measurement of the serum E4 level. And if your patient is JAK2 mutated and serum E4 is subnormal, then the diagnosis of PV is very, very likely and obtaining a bone marrow biopsy is up to the discretion of the patient and the provider. But if the tests are not as clear cut, which happens quite often in practice, for example, if the JAK2 allele burden is less than 1%, then the question is raised, is this just a chip and there's another cause for the erythrocytosis? For those cases, a bone marrow examination is required to see if there are morphological features consistent with MPN. And in other cases in which the JAK2 is unmutated and the EPO is subnormal, if you've ruled out EPO receptor mutation, we should consider bone marrow biopsy and GS testing to see if there's any other myeloid clone that may be explaining uh, the abnormality. And if the JAK2 is not present and serum EPO is normal or elevated, then we have effectively ruled out polycythemia vera. And in those cases, obtaining a bone marrow biopsy is not very beneficial. So here's the uh, diagnostic criteria for PV. Most patients uh, need to fulfill, uh, of course, all the patients need to fulfill the criteria for the elevation in hemoglobin and hematocrit. These are standards for Caucasian patients. So th the race needs to be kept into account based on what are the race adjusted values and every region may have different, a little bit of a difference. We don't really perform red cell mass measurements. They've kind of gone, we don't even have it as an available test at the Mayo. So I think the elevation in hemoglobin and hematocrit is an accurate surrogate for elevated red cell mass, even though there are some uh, publications that suggest it may not be true. Um, presence of the JAK2 V617 or exon 12 mutation and a highly sensitive assay needs to be used. So usually we use an allele specific PCR. Sometimes the sensitive, depending on the sensitivity of the NGS, we may miss some of these mutations if the appropriate test is not ordered. And then, of course, the bone marrow biopsy would have features suggestive of an MPN, which is pan myeloproliferation, changes in the megakaryocytes, and the subnormal EPO level can sometimes corroborate. But EPO measurements can be quite erratic. 
There are cases if a patient has had a phlebotomy before they present to the clinic, the EPO level may not be subnormal because of the effects of the phlebotomy. So all this needs to be kept into consideration. Just to keep in mind, the diagnostic criteria are just a framework, and we have to keep the clinical context into perspective when we make the diagnosis of um, each of these entities. So going back to our patient, his EPO level was 2.2. His JAK2 was mutated. The variant allele frequency was 41%. Bone marrow biopsy had features consistent with PV. The karyotype was normal. So the diagnosis of PV was uh, quite certain in his case, and there were no discrepancies or controversies, which was good. So how do these patients present? Uh, my patient had presented as an asymptomatic, so often these patients may present by chance. The median age of presentation is the sixth decade, male preponderance in PV as opposed to ET. ET has a predilection for female patients. 15% of patients may be young and below 40 years of age. And uh, patients could present by chance, like the patient I illustrated, after a thrombotic event, particularly if they've had an unusual thrombosis, like a splanchnic vein event, or they have constant symptoms such as microvascular symptoms, headaches, you know, erythromedalgia, uh, neur 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 neuropathic pain. Some of those symptoms can also prompt you to check a CBC and lead to the diagnosis of an MPN. Pan myeloproliferation may be present or the patient may have an isolated erythrocytosis. Of course, if there's elevation in the other cell lines, that makes an MPN more likely as opposed to just the hemoglobin and hematocrit are elevated. Splenomegaly is present in only one third of patients with PV. And um, the clinical course of these patients I've tried to summarize here. The main issues are thrombosis, both arterial and venous thrombotic events. So at follow-up, up to a third of patients would have experienced thrombotic events. And a 20-year rate is also 26%. So they are at increased risk for both arterial and venous thrombosis. Disease transformation is a real complication, particularly fibrotic transformation over time, especially over the decade or two, 20-year rate is 16%. Leukemic transformation, thankfully, is rare in less than 5% of the patients. But patients can have non-life-threatening uh, complications as well, such as intractable pruritus, microvascular symptoms, which can impact the quality of life for these patients. So even though they are not imminently dying of the disease, but their quality of life is impaired enough that uh, we need to do better at making them live a better life. So the first thing when we tell patients they have a cancer, particularly myeloproliferative neoplasms, the terminology got changed from disorders to neoplasm. So when you use the term neoplasm, the patients are all concerned that I have a cancer, what is my life expectancy going to be? So if you look at these graphs, we have overall survival in the first panel, ET patients have the longest life expectancy. These are all patients, so they're not stratified by age. And in the next slide, I'll go through stratification by age. Two decades uh, with PV, one and a half decade, and with primary myelofibrosis, less than half a decade. The main issues, as I highlighted earlier, is fibrotic and thrombotic complications. Fibrotic transformation in PV is about incidence of 16% in 20 years, and same thing for thrombotic events. They occur in about a third of the patients through the course of their disease. Leukemic transformation in less than 5% of the patients. And the incidence for ETs, the rates are slightly lower than PV. And for myelofibrosis, the leukemic transformation rates are higher than for ET and PV. When you look at younger patients, specifically patients below 40 years of age, median survival is over three decades, almost four decades. So if, if you have a young patient being diagnosed with a myeloproliferative neoplasm, at least we can reassure them that they are going to have survival in the order of decades and not uh, the immediately life expectancy is not immediately compromised. But when you compare low-risk PV patients who are age and sex match to a general population cohort, and this is the Olmsted County cohort, which is the region around Rochester, Minnesota, and you can see there is a 10-decade difference if you have PV versus if you do not have PV, suggesting that based on the risk for thrombotic complications, their life expectancy may be shorter than their age and sex matched counterparts. So what do we do for these patients? So once we have the diagnosis established, like we have a diagnosis established for my patient, we have to stratify them based on their risk for thrombosis, which is based on age above 60 and prior thrombotic events. 
fibrotic transformation, there is no good model for fibrotic transformation, but we do have a few genetic parameters that can be used to stratify those patients. And for survival, is the survival model mainly is based on age, presence of leukocytosis and venous thrombosis. And I'll go through that. And most recently, over the last couple of years, since next generation sequencing is becoming more commonplace, uh, there's the incorporation of clinical and genetic variables resulting in a MIPS a PV model, which is which can be used particularly if the insurance approves of the NGS testing and if the patient is curious to know what their overall prognosis is going to be, but is not being used in routine practices more because of insurance denials and patients being left with a big medical bill if the NGS is not covered. So here you can see if you stratify patients based on clinical models, such as age, venous thrombosis, and leukocytosis, we can nicely see identify three groups of patients. So for the younger patients without leukocytosis below 11,000 and no prior venous thrombosis, they can expect median survival of up to three decades, as opposed to a patient who's older above 67, presence of either leukocytosis or venous thrombosis, they may have a survival of about a decade. So that's significantly different. And the ones who are in between in the age group or have either leukocytosis or venous thrombosis, they're about two decades. So this can give you a rough idea as how the patient is going to fare. And these are all rough estimates because for every individual patient, there's so many medical factors that go into the picture as well, because as you know, these diseases have long life expectancy. So the medical comorbidities of the patients are a big player because those are the competing risk factors for death for the patients, not necessarily disease evolution. So what is the role of mutations? As I told you, there's a newer uh, survival model, the MIPS-PV. So when we sequenced about 133 patients with PV, you can see that at least half of the patients will have mutations other than the JAK2 mutation. And the most common mutations that I identified are ASXL and TET2 mutations. And the one that I've highlighted here is actually the SRSF2 because that was found to be detrimental for survival. It's present in only 3% of PV patients. It's one of the spliceosome mutations. And you can see here that none of these patients had CALAR or MIPL mutation. So we don't necessarily, if your patient is negative for the JAK2, and testing them for CALAR or MIPL is not necessarily recommended, but sometimes we do our due diligence and check those just to make sure that there's no kind of any typical case going on. So in the MIPS-PV model, we use both clinical variables as well as your genetic variables. And among the genetic variables, the presence of the SRSF2 mutation and abnormal karyotype is prognostic. So when we incorporate use age, leukocytosis, and these genetic variables, we can stratify patients into four risk groups. So once again, these are crude estimates we can share with the patients, uh, especially some of the patients who are middle-aged and uh, are otherwise healthy and want to know their more accurate prognosis beyond just a thrombotic risk stratification. So going back to my patient, so he was 55 years old when I first saw him. He had... Um, Elevation in hemoglobin and hematocrit, his white count was normal, 9,000. Platelet count was relatively normal as well. Um, as you know, the diagnosis of PV was fairly clear cut in his case. And by the risk assessment models, by thrombosis risk, he was below 60 and had no prior thrombosis. So low risk uh, by that. And for survival as well, there was... Um, Age was below 57. There was no leukocytosis or prior venous thrombosis. So clinical models suggested a low risk for a survival as well. MIPS-PV was not assessed because when I first saw him, NGS was not routinely ordered in patients at May, even Mayo. So moving on to how do we approach treatment for this patient? So the goals of treatment are we have to prevent vascular events. He has a few um, comorbidities in the form of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He had a chronic thoracic aortic dissection, which was not repairable, which had left him with, with impairments in his quality of life. Um, and controlling symptoms for these patients, you know, specifically if they have microvascular symptoms, pruritus. And the modalities we have available are, of course, optimization of the cardiovascular risk factors which is easy to accomplish if we partner with the primary care physicians. 
use of antiplatelet therapy, phlebotomy, which we need to be very vigilant about, specifically trying to maintain hematocrit below 45, and then the role of cytoreductive therapy. So we will walk through each one of these. So the role of aspirin in PV uh, has long been established through a very important study, which was actually published almost 20 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which evaluated the safety of low-dose aspirin. The dose of aspirin used was 100 milligram. And I know in different parts of the world, there are different preparations. Here we have a baby aspirin, which is 81 milligram. Some patients just take a full dose aspirin, 325. Some patients take 162. So there's quite a bit of variability in the dosage of aspirin patients use. But at the bare minimum, a baby, low, baby aspirin, a low-dose aspirin, 81 milligrams is recommended. And in this study, you can see that patients had reduced a risk of non-fatal arterial and venous thrombosis and cardiovascular deaths when they received aspirin versus not receiving aspirin. And there were no major bleeding episodes that were increased in the aspirin group because that is the main concern for our patients. Specifically, the main concern arises when they are on anticoagulation, for example, for atrial fibrillation or for any other, or for venous thrombosis. And the question becomes, do we combine the anticoagulation with the aspirin? Often I do combine the two, but if their patient is very high risk for bleeding, then it's okay to skip the aspirin if they are on full dose anticoagulation. Role of phlebotomy has also been long established, but it was not until a decade ago when the stringent parameters were enforced. Previously, uh, we were a little bit liberal. You know, if patients had hematocrit of 48, we would say, okay, we'll just observe, uptitrate the hydrea. But now we are very particular based on the study about keeping hematocrit below 45. For some patients, we even shoot for 44 because the higher you try to shoot it, there may be times that the patient is spending um, when the hematocrit is above 45. So based on this study, if you kept the hematocrit between 45 to 50 versus less than 45, there was a significant difference in death from cardiovascular causes and major thrombosis. So it is very important for us to monitor the CBC depending on your patient's phlebotomy needs and keep the hematocrit below 45 at all times. For women, sometimes 42 was used. And a lot of times we also go by how the patients feel. Sometimes patients start getting symptomatic when the hematocrit is creeping up and they will tell us that, okay, I feel I would prefer to keep it below 43 or below 42, but at least below 45 is what is recommended. And in this study, you can see that um, there was no difference in total deaths, fibrotic or leukemic transformation of bleeding, depending on whether you had strict hematocrit control versus you didn't. So this is mainly to prevent a cardiovascular mortality. So what are some of the newer treatments? I don't want to go over hydrea because I think we've been familiar with hydrea for, for many, many decades. I think the newest treatment that we have available in the United States and uh, Europe is the ROPEG interferon, which is a long-acting interferon preparation. It is very similar in structure to the Pegasus, which is a pegylated interferon, which existed before uh, the ROPEG interferon was approved. The difference is uh, the duration. So ROPEC can be given every two weeks. Pegasus is traditionally given weekly. And then in the maintenance phase, ROPEG is monthly. And uh, the rationale is that by giving it as a longer acting preparation, the side effects are less compared to if you give it more frequently. Like in the olden times, there used to be an intron preparation, which was three times a week, which was very difficult for patients to tolerate. So this has actually enhanced the tolerability and it is approved uh, for PV patients. Um, and... Uh, Based on the large study, this is the phase three proud PV study, we have over five years of follow-up that has been published. And when it was compared to best available therapy, which is mainly hydrea, if you see 97% of the patients received hydrea and the best available therapy arm, the complete hematological response rates were much higher with the ROPEG versus the hydrea. Patients were able to achieve molecular response. And I think in the MPN field, now that has garnered a lot of interest because everybody wants to have some disease modification and not just symptom control. And that's kind of been the main critique in the MPN world is that we don't have treatments that are disease modifying. So there is some suggestion that the interferon preparations may be able to play that role. But of course, the follow-up has not been long enough to demonstrate any difference in the incidence of thrombosis or fibrotic or leukemic transformations. So we don't truly know that if it translates, the molecular responses translate into disease modification quite yet. 
So usually the starting dose for Ropeg interferon is about 50 microgram every two weeks, and then you can up titrate based on the patient. My own personal uh, practice is to start low so that patients tolerate the medicine. Since it's a long acting medicine, we expect that it's going to build up. So we don't need to be in a big hurry to up titrate very quickly because with the doses over the next couple of months, uh, you will see that there will be uh, changes in the CBC, particularly patients may start developing neutropenia or thrombocytopenia, which may necessitate reduction in the dose. So hence going slow is a better way. The package insert actually recommends 100 microgram every two weeks, but I have been usually starting at 50 to be even more modest. This is another uh, large study which was recently published in the New England Journal Evidence uh, Journal, which looked at the role of ROPEG interferon in low-risk polycythemia vera. Because traditionally, we don't uh, recommend cytoreductive therapy for low-risk patients. But in this study, they randomized patients to receive phlebotomy alone versus ROPEG. And the dose used was 100 microgram every two weeks. And the primary endpoint was hematocrit control, particularly keeping the hematocrit below 45 over the next year in the absence of progressive disease. And as you can see, the hematocrit control was much better in patients who got the ROPEG versus phlebotomy alone. There was no disease progression with ROPEG, but there was disease progression in the phlebotomy arm because they're not receiving any treatment, which would change the outlook of the disease. And there was changes in the JAK2 allele burden, which was not new news since it had already been shown in the proud PV data. And there was partial molecular response in about a third of patients. And they had a follow-up up until two years, which for PV is not a very long follow-up since as I reviewed with you earlier in my lecture, that these patients have a life expectancy of several decades. So at two-year mark as well, phlebotomy was more superior to, uh, ROPEG was more superior to phlebotomy, sorry. And the side effect profile was in no way uh, different enough that it would make you not give ROPEG to patients. So there is a role of putting your low-risk PV patients on ROPEG based on this data, specifically if your patient has increasing phlebotomy needs in the situation of pregnancy or some situation which requires cytoreductive therapy. If your patient has thrombosis, a splanchnic wing thrombosis, a young woman with PV and splanchnic wing thrombosis, and you need to use cytoreduction, then ROPEG is a good option for them. What is the role of JAK inhibitors? Ruxolotinib is a proof treatment for myelofibrosis for the last 12 years or so. And then ruxolotinib is also a proof for polycythemia vera, which is refractory or intolerant to hydria. So this is data from the response trial where patients were randomized to ruxolotinib versus standard of treatment, and the majority were receiving hydroxyurea, as you would expect. And the endpoint was hematocrit control as well as spleen control. And both measures were better with ruxolotinib versus standard treatment, which is not surprising because we do expect some anemia when you start even your myelofibrosis patients on ruxolotinib, and we expect spleen reductions uh, in those patients. The adverse event profile, of course, was more with the ruxolotinib treatment, particularly some patients got anemic thrombocytopenia, and there were instances of zoster. So usually before I start my patients on ruxolotinib, I advise them to take the shingles vaccine. And if they've had an episode of shingles, I usually keep them on acyclovir to make sure there's no further reactivation. So that suggests that there is a role to use ruxolotinib, specifically if your patient has a big spleen has other constitutional symptoms, which is suggesting that they may be on the end towards transforming to myelofibrosis. This is the most recent data actually on PV and ruxolotinib, the MAGIC PV study, which was just published in the JCO a few months ago, when ruxolotinib was compared to best available therapy in patients that were hydria resistant or intolerant. This is the five-year data from that study, and the major events were classified as either vascular events, thrombosis, hemorrhage, disease transformation, or death. And you can see from the graph here that patients on the ruxolotinib arm had fewer major events. So the event-free survival was superior and CR rates were higher with ruxolotinib, which also translated into a superior event-free survival. The molecular remissions were higher with ruxolotinib and the paper suggested that the longer patients have been on ruxolotinib, the JAK2 allele burden went down further with longer duration of treatment, and the molecular responses were associated with improved outcomes. 
suggesting that there may be a role for oxalotinib early on in the treatment of PV, but that is to be determined. We have to kind of weigh the risk benefit profile for each of these patients and then decide whether that's in the patient's best interest. And what is the role for the hepcidin mimetic ruspertide, which is kind of a substitute for phlebotomy for patients? Uh, this medication has entered phase three trials. So I'm going to review with you the phase two data and hopefully we'll hear some phase three results at the upcoming meetings, perhaps at ASH this year. So what happens in polycythemia vera is there's low hepcidin level. And we all know that hepcidin is a major regulator of iron. And when hepcidin is low, the ferroportin remains open and the iron is all available to produce more red blood cells. And hence there's increased red cell production and the hematocrit goes up. So what the hepcidin mimetic does is it basically replaces the hepcidin for these patients and closes the ferroportin. So iron is not available and patients are not able to produce more red blood cells and the hematocrit control is achieved in that fashion. So here I have the data for the phase two study and it was in several parts and it had a mixed bag of patients. Just to tell you, there were low risk patients, there were high risk patients, a Half of the patients actually were on other treatments, which included interferon, hydria, and ruxolotinib. And what the study shows was that all patients had a decline in the phlebotomy needs and became phlebotomy-free, regardless of what treatment arm they were on. And symptoms of iron deficiency were reversed, and patients felt better. The MP and SAF scores improved in a third of the patients, and there were no major side effects. The only issues were some injection site reactions, which you would expect with the sub-Q preparation. And there has been another parallel study that is being used for the use of rusfertide. The phase two data was for patients who were already requiring three or more phlebotomies over six months. So they were having difficulties with hematocrit control. But when they used rusfertide as induction therapy for newly diagnosed patients, it was able to bring the hematocrit under control within a month. So that is pretty impressive in the sense that it can achieve rapid hematocrit control without the need for phlebotomies in newly diagnosed patients. But more data needs to be revealed. This was a smaller study, about 16 patients. So I think we need a little bit longer follow-up to determine the role. But rispertide is in phase three study. So it was to be determined if it may get approved and may be an alternative to phlebotomy, which is cumbersome for patients. So based on all the treatments that we reviewed, here is the current treatment approach in PV. We want to continue with phlebotomy to maintain hematocrit below 45 at all times. Low-dose aspirin, and the doses are quite variable depending on the region the patient is in. And you stratify your patient's risk, low risk versus high risk, which for PV is easy. It's based on age and prior thrombosis. And for your high-risk patients, definitely cytoreductive therapy is required. Hydria is kind of the first line therapy, but for the, there are alternatives. Specifically, the use of interferons is gaining quite a bit of favor, at least in the United States. We have the older preparation, the Pegasus preparation, or the newer one, the Ropeg, which is every two weeks instead of weekly. And then for patients who do not respond well to hydria or are not able to tolerate the medicine for, due to ankle ulcers or any kind of toxicities, we can consider the use of busulfan and elderly patients, busulfan use has to be done very cautiously because it causes significant myelosuppression and patients need to be off treatment for a couple of months once we get to that phase. So I usually do about two milligrams five days a week instead of keeping them on higher doses of busulfan and are very cautious if we see the trend in the counts. If they're beginning to drop quite a bit, then holding the treatment early on is a better answer than waiting for them to actually be below the normal ranges. And then ruxolotinib. And for now, we are kind of keeping it as more of a last resort, but it may move up the treatment paradigm, specifically if there is more data that suggests that the molecular responses translate into a disease transformation or survival benefit. For the younger patients, um, you, we can consider cytoreductive therapy, specifically if they are having difficulty with hematocrit control. And there are a subset of patients who have to go in for frequent phlebotomies. They start getting iron deficient and are symptomatic from that. So it is not unreasonable to start them on a cytoreductive therapy to help achieve that. For a pregnant woman, if there's high-risk pregnancy, there's role for the use of interferon for that pregnancy. If there's severe pruritus, if the spleen is causing lots of in, uh, trouble, even though the patient may not be high-risk. So there are some situations. And definitely for your patients who've had venous thrombosis, 
we do recommend indefinite anticoagulation. The anticoagulant that is most commonly being used is um, the new anticoagulant agents, which are the direct oral anticoagulations, because of warfarin and the issues with the INR monitoring. And of course, if patient has had bleeding complications, then the use of antiplatelet agent and anticoagulation has to be weighed in. And I usually hold the aspirin and continue patients on perhaps a prophylactic dose of anticoagulant if possible. And then there are obviously unique management issues. I kind of briefly went through some of them through the course of my lecture, but I will highlight here for pregnant patients, for low-risk pregnancies, aspirin alone may be enough. We expect the hematocrit to drop throughout the pregnancy, so there should not be that much phlebotomy needs, but you should keep the hematocrit below 42 in the pregnant women. And uh, low molecular weight heparin if there is a venous thrombosis history. We do not routinely recommend uh, peripartum uh, anticoagulation before delivery or after delivery unless there is a suspicion that there is, this is a high-risk pregnancy. And you could consider the use of interferon specifically for the high-risk pregnancy, and especially in a high-risk PV patient. If they need the cytoreductive therapy, then interferon would be the preferred agent since hydria is teratogenic. And for anticoagulation as well, warfarin is teratogenic, so we have to go with the low molecular weight heparin. Pruritus is another issue that some patients are plagued with. Thankfully, it is, not, it is only a subset of patients. We have uh, quite a few agents to deal with pruritus, and sometimes we have to play around because it's hard to determine if the agent is going to work for your patient. Low-dose SSRI, paroxetine, has been used. There's role for ultraviolet phototherapy, which we arranged to our dermatology colleagues. Uh, interferon may have a role. Ruxolotinib helps with itching. And then the recently published series with the use of omaluzumab, it is an IgE-directed monoclonal antibody, which is approved for asthma and nasal polyps. So there may be approval uh, issues specifically with insurance. So they actually studied about seven patients with ET and PV. Half of them had PV. And half of the patients actually had complete resolution of pruritus. And then the other half had partial resolution of pruritus. So suggest that this may be a very effective therapy, specifically if you have a patient whose pruritus is so intractable that it's impacting their quality of life. And sometimes maintaining the lower hematocrit for those patients also helps. For example, if they are having erythromyalgia or refractory pruritus, keeping the hematocrit below 42 may be uh, beneficial for those cases. Splanchnic vein thrombosis is another situation we encounter in our practice particularly in young female patient. Anticoagulation, usually we start with the low molecular weight heparin at the time of diagnosis, and then we switch them to most likely a direct oral anticoagulant unless there are financial issues where they can't afford a DOAC. Uh, use of cytoreductive therapy also is mandated in these patients. And for the younger female patients, I'll often do interferon-based therapy rather than hydria, but it's a discussion between you and the patient specifically if they've completed childbearing and in their 40s. Perioperative management comes about quite a bit as well. Uh, we want to keep the hematocrit below 45, especially if it's an elective surgery, platelet count below 450. Often a short course of hydria is given, even if it's a low-risk patient. And if it's a high-risk surgery, a low molecular weight heparin should be used, specifically if they're going to have immobilization after the procedure. So going back to my patient, so... I kind of, uh, we didn't forget about him. We go through his management. So here I'm just highlighting again, he was below 60 years of age when he came to me. He had no thrombosis history, but had had a chronic thoracic aortic dissection with uh, chronic chest pain, um, diagnosis of PV. So he was deemed low risk based on the risk stratification models that we use in practice, low risk for thrombosis, low risk for survival. MIPS PV was not assessed in that era. He was started on phlebotomy and low-dose aspirin when he was first seen in the clinic, and he had continued to have frequent phlebotomy needs uh, with hypotensive episodes because his baseline blood pressure because of the chronic aortic dissection was 90 by 60. So each time he would go in to get half a liter removed, I often had to get 250 cc's removed, give him fluids, and it became quite laborious because um, it was not easy for the patient or for the provider. So I started him on hydria to help. And at that time, we didn't have much of the data on the interferon. So hence, even though he was below 60 years of age and a low risk patient, I went with hydria since it was easy for us to manage that too, because he was a little bit not very close to my clinic. 
then over the years i've been following him diligently he had been doing well he had one episode of thrombosis after an ankle fracture for which he continued on anticoagulation but the main changes that happened was recently when i saw him he's no longer um sorry i had the no thrombosis there but that was from my prior note no longer requiring phlebotomy his hemoglobin is 11.7 his white count was significantly up it was 55.9 blasts were 1% platelet count was 252 and he's been having some symptoms night sweats his spleen was enlarged on exam and on imaging um it's fairly large it's 32 cm and he was requiring narcotics to manage his pain so this is a patient you need you get concerned about disease evolution you know it's been almost a decade uh he had a prior diagnosis of pv which was well established he's developed anemia no uh, no phlebotomy requirements over the last year um he didn't have much of a leukoerythroblastic picture on his smear though uh he had 1% blast but there was significant leukocytosis increasing splenomegaly and he has constitutional symptoms in the form of uh night sweats so i of course i repeated a bone marrow biopsy on him after many years mf2 on the marrow his karyotype is very high risk he has acquired a deletion 11q23 abnormality and previously at his diagnosis he was normal karyotype and we did not have any interim bone marrow biopsies for him and his ngs actually did not have any high risk mutations he has a sibl mutation at 3% waf and a jak2 which is expected for a pv patient um so going back to now management of myelofibrosis because he has post pv myelofibrosis i know there are several um, prognostication models for the secondary myelofibrosis uh, but usually i just use the mips um, version 2.0 because that is applicable to patients regardless of what kind of myelofibrosis they have there is the mysec model but that is quite truncated which does not incorporate all the features so if you go the by the mips version 2 point o his karyotype is very high risk which gives him four points he doesn't have any high risk mutations he doesn't have asxl u2af srsf2 uh, or any of those mutations that would give him high points he has no type 1 calr mutation because he's a pv patient so that gives him two points and he has some clinical features he has two points for the constitutional symptoms and that by itself gives him eight points and puts him at a high risk patient so looking through this treatment algorithm for the high and very high risk patients especially the younger patients we have to consider early allogeneic central transplant he is quite symptomatic so we have some work to do to help shrink his spleen and optimize him before we line him up for transplant and uh, there are modalities of treatment as listed in the slide that can help us manage his symptoms so he is a patient with symptomatic splenomegaly um or cytosis without major anemia so hydroxyurea is something he was already on so ruxolotinib would be a good treatment for him to be able to shrink the spleen help with his constitutional symptoms optimize him refer him to the transplant colleagues and get the donor search going if he was just anemic without spleen issues then our options are quite limited we have um imid therapy thalidomide prednisone lenalidomide esa use is very it's not very effective especially in patients with a big spleen you can use danazol and there are a few newer jak inhibitors which have promise for anemia momelotinib is not yet approved in fact the fda date got pushed even forward it's now going to be decided mid september but there is a jak inhibitor pecrotinib which may have some anti anemia effects which could be considered if there is anemia as the main issue if the patient's platelet count is low usually pecrotinib is the preferred jak inhibitor in the united states because it is approved for patients with cytopenia particularly with platelet count below 50000 and then for the ruxolotinib failure patients there's always a dilemma you can always switch the jak inhibitor but the main thing is if the patient is transplant eligible and is transplantable try to refer them early to the transplant colleagues we can consider clinical trials there are several phase 3 trials that are ongoing for mf a lot of them are using combination therapy with ruxolotinib and different mechanisms such as telomerase inhibition then there is um bet inhibitors so there are a couple of trials but i don't know if that's the right answer because we are not don't know yet if they are going to be disease modifying either so if your patient is young and transplant eligible transplant should be considered so going back to my patient he is mip 70 version 2.0 high risk his 10 year survival is 
And at this point, he's 63 years old. Uh, so he has been referred for transplant. Uh, the donor search is ongoing. He was started on ruxolotinib um, a few months ago. I usually start at a modest dose because I don't know how the patient will do. So I usually start 10 milligrams PID. And one month after starting the ruxolotinib, he already was feeling better. He was off narcotics. His spleen was clinically uh, smaller, but still enlarged. His symptoms were better. So we were able to up titrate the ruxolotinib to 20 BID. He was continued on hydria because he still continued to have leukocytosis. Uh, his peak leukocyte count was 76,000. 76, and as I mentioned earlier, he had only 1% blast. So it's not like he's transforming to acute leukemia. That often gets to be feared specifically when patients start getting very proliferative. So this is the program he's on with the hopes of getting to a transplant. So this is my summary slide. And my take home messages for you this evening is that the diagnostic approach to MPN remains unchanged. I know we have two classification systems, ICC and WHO, but thankfully for MPN, there are no discrepancies between the two and there have been no major changes. There is an emerging role of using mutations to prognosticate patients for survival. This is common practice in myelofibrosis, but for both ET and PV, it will probably become practice over the years. It's going to take some time, particularly for insurance companies to approve NGS testing and for us to validate these findings in other series. There are some newer therapies for PV which are exciting, specifically the use of interferon. And there could be a role for early treatment in low-risk patients, particularly if we demonstrate over time that it reduces the risk for fibrotic transformation or leukemic transformation. And that is to be determined as well with the longer-term follow-up from some of the studies. Role for the hypsidin mimetic ruspertide to cut down phlebotomy needs or actually eliminate phlebotomy needs, which is very attractive for patients so they don't have to keep going and keep monitoring the hematocrit all the time. And for MF, the JAK inhibitors have a palliative role. So we should be cognizant of that, that they're helpful for symptom control and spleen control, but allergenic transplant is the only modality which secures long-term survival for these patients and is recommended early on specifically for high and very high risk patients, despite the ongoing clinical trials. Unless there is a contraindication to transplant and the patient does not want to pursue it, then that would be a different story, but we have to have a very frank discussion with our patients. So I'm going to end here and thank you all for your attention. And I'm excited to take questions, which is always the most interesting part of the lecture. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Naseema, for that wonderful talk and updating us on this subject. So a lot of colleagues over here, maybe they can either just raise hands or start open their videos, ask questions to Dr. Naseema. Meanwhile, I have a question in the chat box. Is there a role for ruxolitinib? Is there a role for ruxolitinib pulse therapy? And what is the role of combination of ruxolitinib with the hydroxyurea? I'm not quite sure I understand what do you mean by pulse therapy. So whoever, uh, Dr. Ravikaran, if you can um, just give me an example of what you mean by that. So I'll answer the second part first. There is a role for combination ruxolitinib and hydrea. And the patient I highlighted was one of the examples. Specifically, if my patient has leukocytosis, I often need to keep them on both. Uh, the issue becomes thrombocytopenia, because as you know, ruxolotinib causes thrombocytopenia, and if you use very high doses of hydria to maintain the leukocytes under control, that can also cause thrombocytopenia. So as long as we are not encountering those issues, there's definitely a role to combine the two agents. There is because ruxolotinib is not the best medicine to bring the white count down. So if your patient is quite proliferative, there are situations when I use the combination. Thank you. Dr. Ravi Kiran, do you want to ask the first question directly? You are here. Okay, meanwhile, we'll go to Dr. Chirag. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, I have few a uh, few questions. Uh, uh, so, First is a patient of mine, about 60 years old, who transformed from PV to acute myeloid leukemia uh, within just about two years of diagnosis. And uh, we talked about the option of 7 plus 3, um, and he was not uh, willing for that, or very reluctant rather. So we have started him on 
रुक्सोलिटिनिप ट्वेंटी फाइव मिलीग्राम बी डी एंड इट इज ओनली वन मंथ एंड हीज नंबर्स आर मच बेटर सो वॉट एल्स कैन बी डू एंड वॉट टू एक्सपेक्ट so you raise a very important point about blast phase mpn uh, sorry in this lecture i i kind of left that out because of the time constraints too there was only a few things i could focus on so this is a feared complication as you know uh, your patient is he's transplant eligible we have to consider that because that's the only treatment that can give him even some years because without transplant he, the life expectancy with chemotherapy that we have whatever regimen you use is going to be less than a year even if your patient is the fittest patient who responds achieves a cr it's going to be a very short lived cr so for your patient if he does not want 7 plus 3 i'm presuming he doesn't want aggressive treatment is that correct yes he does not want right so i would probably go with hma ven i know there's venetoclax um, available in india and we i do share a few patients with some of the uh, in, uh, yes. colleagues in india so that would be a good one to try to get him into response and just palliate him but understanding that he is not going to have a very long life expectancy even with hma ven we have published extensively on this topic do you have his genetic profile does he have any what kind of mutation and karyotype does he have so he uh, i actually off and i don't remember but nothing uh, very major uh, none of those high risk mutations Okay. Does he have IDH mutation? Because the other option is twenty percent of patients with MPN BP have a IDH mutation. So you could uh, consider a single agent ivacidinib or nisidinib. Because looks like your patient wants the least um, aggressive approach, but yet wants treatment. He doesn't want hospice, right? So, so no. I think you have a few ways. I think ruxolitinib by itself. There is a trial on HMA plus ruxolitinib. if you look at the fine details the cr rates were very low they kind of lumped overall response rate you know where they count pr and you know all the other minor responses to so if you want your patient to go into cr to improve his quality of life and counts i think hma ven is the way to go yeah so do i continue ruxolitinib with that i usually don't unless you need ruxo to control symptoms do you need it for the spleen or the symptoms right no he does not have splenomegaly yeah if he doesn't need it for symptoms i would not because triplet therapy is hard to do we often will do a low dose for patients who have a very big spleen but in this situation i probably would discontinue or taper him off if he hasn't been on it long enough so this hydroxyurea can be added to this or it would would not be much of a use uh, no, I, how is the white count white count is 70000 and with ruxolitinib it has come down to about 30000 in a one month time so we need to bring his white count lower before i would treat with venetoclax i usually bring it below 25 because the risk of tls is very high as you know from my aml cohort and uh, so you're right i would continue hydri and ruxo bring the white count down and then probably overlap the hma ven with the ruxo you can do that start bringing down the dose and you can still start the hma ven and then slowly kind of get rid of the ruxo okay the other thing about the transplant one second question was in the same line you mentioned but we are all very uh, concerned about transplant in the mpn patients uh, the data is very sparse at least in the experience in india and what we hear is the high mortality uh, and lower results can you tell us about you know, that the results of transplant Ah, uh, in the United States, the results are not as dismal as you are making it sound. It depends on the patient substrate. It depends on the donor. But now all the approaches have improved. The field of transplant has improved, and that's the reason the early transplant is better. Because when our MPN patients are very high risk, they become moribund. They get ascites. They get such big spleen. That is not a good time to transplant. In fact, they get turned down for transplant because. when you have such a big spleen you won't engraft there's risk for complications if you already have portal hypertension so i think a lot has to do with timing perhaps they are being referred late enough that they are so sick that the mortality is higher so i think here at least in the united states in our center we um want to refer them at, especially even if your patient is asymptomatic and if i diagnose a patient and if i mips b2 
they are intermediate or high risk and transplant eligible, we put in the transplant consult right away. And when they become treatment requiring, we are thinking that let's do soon. Even though we have ruxolotinib, we have all these other JAK inhibitors, because if you lose the window, that's when the outcome becomes worse. Oh, thank you. Uh, another question is about the high WBC in a patient with PV. Uh, so if their numbers are, say, about 12,000, 14,000, should we try to correct that with hydroxyurea? That's a very important question you raise. If it's a low-risk patient, I have not been correcting with hydroxyurea, but you could make a case, well, if they're high risk, you know, even we know that leukocytosis has been associated with increased thrombosis, with survival. So you could make a case, especially if there's a ongoing phlebotomy needs, I think it's a reasonable suggestion to correct with hydrea. We know hydrea is a safe medicine, even if patients take it for decades. So even if you have a young patient who's gonna be on some treatment for decades, it's, it's okay. And the same question for high platelet count, especially after phlebotomy, some of them get a higher platelet. Should we correct that? I usually don't, it depends. You check their iron levels, and of course, if you're phlebotomizing your patient, they're going to be deficient in iron. The ferritin for PV patients is always low. I do not recommend replacing iron. There's only a very select group of patients when they are suffering severely from iron deficiency that I keep the hematocrit low and give them IV iron, but it's like adding fuel to the fire. But usually I don't correct the thrombocytosis because thrombocytosis per se has not been directly correlated with thrombotic events, more the leukocytosis and the hematocrit actually. And one last question, uh, there are patients where we do all the workup and uh, everything else seems okay. And the, you know, we don't find a reason for high hemoglobin hematocrit. And there is only smoking and alcohol and their hemoglobin is 19. Uh, how do you manage these people, hematocrit 58? I think you are you are opening a whole different field. Maybe I can return back on this forum. Uh, okay. We have written a whole, uh, I don't know, do you follow the American Journal of Hematology? So I have put together a whole diagnostic algorithm of JAK2 unmutated erythrocytosis. And that's a very interesting topic because if there is no good cause, if you have in like idiopathic erythrocytosis, if that's what you're referring to, yes. it depends on how deep and thorough your workup is. You know, but there will still be, a subset of patients where we don't find a cause. If they're not symptomatic, we don't recommend phlebotomy. If they have any symptoms that usually improve with phlebotomy, you could do periodic phlebotomy based on symptoms, but there's no role to keep the hematocrit below 45 or like, you know. So it's a very interesting area because I don't know about you guys in India, but here we are using a lot of SGLT inhibitors. I, you, are you familiar with the diabetic medicine? They're yes. being used for heart yes. failure, kidney disease, and they cause erythrocytosis. So we are seeing a whole referral. So anytime the hemoglobin hematocrit goes up, uh, they refer to hematology because we are so accessible. So for those medicines, it's a very known cause. So be very careful in your workup. Look through the medicines. Look for where is this patient from. Do imaging studies, sleep apnea screening. So the workup has to be quite thorough. Check for hemochromatosis. And then when you don't have a cause, I think we are reassured by saying this is not clonal. Uh, secondary erythrocytosis does not put you at increased risk for strokes and heart attacks. And you counsel the patient and just monitor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question from where Chirag asked, if you have a young person who has had thrombosis and for some reason you've done the NGS panel and it is bad, will you subject that patient to allotransplant? Somebody's 30, 35, thrombosis, bad NGS. Uh, and it's a PV patient? PV, PV. Yeah, I've had a young PV patient who was P53 mutated when I first saw him. And by the time I saw him back, he had already progressed to acute leukemia. So you are correct. If my PV patient has P53 mutation, and you know, uh, I would be in favor of doing an early transplant, even though it's not kind of traditional. But if you look at these patients in real life, actually, I feel badly for him because he was 55. I saw him last summer. And by the time I had a follow-up visit arranged, he had already been hospitalized locally with AML. 
So the risk for progression for those patients is very high because we may be actually picking them at a point where they've acquired the P53 or any high-risk mutation, and they may be just not manifesting clinically as a more aggressive myeloid neoplasm. So I would treat it like an aggressive myeloid neoplasm and transplant early. Thank you. And one question from again where Chirag asked of you about erythrocytosis patient. If the hematocrit is 52 and above, the viscosity increases and patients can become symptomatic. So do you think they should be phlebotomized to bring to at least 52 or not even that? I only go by the symptoms. You know, I have patients who are hanging out. Sometimes if they're going to have a surgery, suppose they're going for some hernia surgery or something, I'll probably try to be careful because it can't hurt them, you know, but I don't routinely try to follow the hematocrit and try to keep it because I know there are some British society guidelines which suggest keep it about 52 or 50 and they keep changing. I have not been doing that in my practice. And so far, touch wood, I have not had an adverse outcome and I hope not. But um, it's a very interesting area because it depends on why the hematocrit is up. Like you said, there are a big chunk of patients where we don't know why it's up and that's very unsatisfying for both the physician and the patient because you really don't know what you're dealing with. But if I've ruled out a clonal cause, I think I'm quite reassured. Those are patients I subject them to NGS. I'll do a whole bone marrow biopsy. I'll just make sure they do not have an atypical presentation of an MPN or something. If you have a congenital cyanotic heart disease with quite a bit of polycythemia and the child or the patient is going for surgery, uh, do you phlebotomize them or do you give hydroxyurea? There was a study for the use of hydrea in congenital heart disease. It was a small study. It did not show any benefit. And uh, I usually would not phlebotomize that because it's a compensor. If we know it's physiological, like COPD patients, even the chew ash poly, if, if it's physiological, in fact, you could do them more harm. They kind of need the higher hematocrit. And I think in congenital heart disease, the literature, when I reviewed it for our review paper, which I was referring to, was very equivocal about the role of phlebotomy. In fact, they were discouraging it because you know it can actually create a vicious cycle. You phlebotomize and the iron deficiency actually perpetuates more RBC production. So it can actually make the situation even more worse. Thank you. Rajan, your question. Uh, I'm uh, audible. You're audible. Ma'am, ma ma I have two questions on the ends of extreme. What is your opinion on the use of decitabine in blastoises? The first one. And second, your thoughts on loose partercept in myelofibrosis associated anemia. I'll go with the second one because I didn't hear the first one properly. So I'll have Dr. Agarwal translate for me. So lospartacept is approved, as you know, for MDS, RS. And I have used lospartacept off-label for MF, and we published on this. Actually, the results were quite underwhelming. It doesn't work very well, especially these are the patients who already failed a lot of treatments before you try to use an off-label drug, right? So um, it can be used specifically if your patient has SF3B, if they have ring sideroblasts, if your MF patient has, you could extrapolate it. I'm not saying it's an absolute no-no, but I don't think it's very effective. We have to wait and see what the phase three Rospartacept MF study suggests. And even in that study, the benefit was in combination with Ruxo rather than the Rospartacept arm alone. So it's hard to know if maybe it's some synergy, like it's kind of blunting the anemia, which you would typically see with Ruxo rather than like truly bringing up the hemoglobin. And what I'll was revisit your my first question. Uh, I visit, I, I work in a resource constraint setting. So what is your take on use of uh, decitabine in blast prices? Or decitabine alone? Decitabine, yeah. Alone. We used to use that uh, before the Veneto Clax was available. That's what we had on the shelf. Uh, I don't have, I think it can be used uh, because if you are in a dire situation where you don't have the resources, it's fair game to use, but you know that it's not going to be as effective because HMAs alone take several cycles for patients to respond. And hence the combination of the HMA when really made it to, uh, it was a big, disc, a big uh, achievement for us in the myeloid field because the time to response is one to two months versus three to four months. And these patients don't have that much time to actually hang around for that long. So it would not be very effective, but you can use it. The CR rate with HMA alone 
in a blast phase series was actually no patient achieved CR. So you may achieve some partial response at best. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajan. One question from audience. Uh, Sumit Mirg has a question. In a newly diagnosed PV patient with or without thrombosis, what will be your practice of phlebotomy? Um, practice of phlebotomy, I check the CBC at least every, every week when they're newly diagnosed. And when they're newly diagnosed, they need a lot of phlebotomy depending on what hematocrit they start out with. So often our patients will be needing um, phlebotomy every week or every other week. We keep the hematocrit below 45. And, and as I alluded to in my lecture, if there are very frequent needs, we can add a cytoreductive agent in those situations, even though there's no history of thrombosis. And now that we have data for the use of interferon in low-risk patients, that's something I've been doing for my low-risk patients typically is adding um, Pegasus or Ropeg uh, to cut the phlebotomy, especially if they're going every month and it's been one year since the diagnosis, that's a lot of phlebotomy. So I don't want to deal with iron deficiency and the symptoms of that. Thank you. The use of interferon is continuous or on and off, depending upon control of the disease? It is on or off based on the counts. Of course, if we are dealing with neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, I usually start low for that reason. Because if you go by the package insert, even for Ropeg, they recommend 100 microgram every two weeks. I usually do 50. My plan is to keep them on it longer rather than to do bursts of treatment. Because if you do low, they can tolerate it. They will like staying on it. You can even make it 50 microgram every month, like in the maintenance phase. So I have not had to really stop interferon unless if I notice that the neutropenia is developing or thrombocytopenia, then you know you need a washout. But a lot of times, if you keep it at a low dose, you can keep them on treatment longer. And I think that's the key. Then they become, they don't like going back on it. They say my counts had dropped and, you know, it makes the patient also uncomfortable. Thank you. Ramesh, your question. Good evening, ma'am. It was an excellent presentation. I have a couple of questions. My first question is uh, for an young uh, male who is presenting with uh, thrombosis and doing uh, thrombosis evaluation, we found we find that the patient has got a duct mutation. And when we look, look at the count, only the hemoglobin is in the borderline, like uh, say around 15. But the leukocyte count and platelet count is absolutely normal. Do you think cyto reduction like uh, hydroxyurea would benefit in these patients? So if the counts are relatively normal, this sounds more like an MP and U case. You know, we have patients who have JAK2, like patients with splank neck vein thrombosis with JAK2, but they don't have abnormal counts. I usually observe them. I put them on anticoagulation, of course, if they've had thrombosis. But if they don't have, I think you can observe without cyto reduction. Okay. The second question is like question? A... Yes, sir. Yes. The second question is... Yeah. Go ahead. For a for an elderly patient uh, who's got a severe pancytopenia, uh, who's recovering uh, frequent transfusions, and uh, platelet count is say always around ten thousand uh, with frequent bleeds, how to manage this kind of patients with severe uh, myelofibrosis? Very difficult situation. So even though if your patient doesn't have high risk disease and stuff, there's no good treatment. I have to be honest with you. If they're needing platelet transfusions. I've used medicines like TPO, uh, thalidomide PRED, and unfortunately, I haven't had good success. You can use pecritinib because it's approved for MF with platelets below 50,000, but I'm not sure. This is actually suggesting very high-risk disease unless there's another cause for the thrombocytopenia, if there's a concomitant ITP or something going on. I've tried all kinds of things. Sometimes I even try ITP-directed kind of rituxin. You know, anything is fair game for these situations because most of the time, nothing really works, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Ashwari, you have a question? Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, polycythemia vera, uh, I ha have a couple of patients. Uh, so I started them on low, uh, low, low dose aspirin. And with the cytoreductive therapy, uh, or with the phlebotomy, gradually their platelets, uh, platelet count initially it was somewhere around seven, eight lakh, but it has normalized. Or for one of my patients, it has dropped to like 1.5 uh, lakhs. So, do I continue or uh, like it's okay if I stop the uh, aspirin now? 
And do I need to restart like if with due course it goes up again? Uh, are you are you saying the platelets are 1.5 million? Is that what no. you say? No, 1. 150,000. 150,000. Yeah. Okay. So I I'm, I didn't quite get your question. Are you what you're saying? You have your patient on aspirin, and the patient now, initially at the time of diagnosis of PV they had thrombocytosis, but with the therapy uh, and were started on low dose aspirin along with uh, hydroxyurea. So mm -hmm. now uh, with the therapy over the uh, next two or uh, three four months, the platelets either normalize or like it, they are on the lower side. So do we continue the aspirin? I would continue the aspirin as long as your platelets are above 50,000. I think the aspirin is the most important medicine here. Your question should be, is the dose of hydrea needing down titration? I don't know. How much hydrea is your patient on? I started on 1,000, like 500 twice, and then I came down to 500 once uh, daily. Maybe you can do 500 three times a week, you know, because okay. it's suggesting that the platelets are going down. And the effects of hydrea are also very cumulative. And you probably figured out from your practice, if patients are on it for longer, you see the counts are downsliding. So this is what it is telling you. I wouldn't stop the hydrea because the reason you put the hydrea was because the patient needed cytoreduction or you just put it for the platelets? No, uh, phleb, uh, he was patient was requiring a, a frequent phlebotomy. Like it okay. was uh, weekly. Plus, uh, initial WBCs are also some 12,000, 14,000 okay. in that range. Yeah, I think I would down titrate the dose and then you will not encounter thrombocytopenia because in this situation, if the platelets continue to go down at the rate they are, you are going to have to hold hydrea. So it's better to just be proactive and decrease the dose, okay? Okay. And uh, again, I have a couple of uh, idiopathic erythrocytosis uh, as what we discussed. So these are young patients in their 30s normal karyotype, the uh, MPN panel is negative, uh, bone marrow is normal, EPO is slightly on the lower side or uh, low also, below uh, norm uh, normal. So do you advise, like, how strongly should we convince them for NGS or clinical exome sequencing? I would check hereditary erythrocytosis, especially for young patient with subnormal EPO, EPO receptor mutation at the bare minimum right? Because you don't want to miss that out, you know, and link mutation. So I would do the NGS on this patient at least and hereditary erythrocytosis testing. So is it uh, for hereditary erythrocytosis, uh, like if there's no family history, despite that, I need to explain this to the patient. Yes, because sometimes the family history is not known. And this is the first case, and especially young patient. And the other important thing- smokers, like no secondary cause, all secondary causes ruled out. The other important thing to do is look at the counts from before. If you have a chance in the in the childhood, if you're able to track back the CBCs, that's actually a very important thing because sometimes it tells you, is it a lifelong history or is it more acquired, right? And I think sometimes we don't have access to those. Even in, the, in this country, we don't have access. So I'm sure it's the same problem in India, but that would be... Uh, tip off. So that's why I check the patient because if I don't know if it's lifelong or there's no family history, I still check it. Uh, and my last question, like uh, skin darkening and uh, like hyperpigmentation is uh, a side effect of hydroxyurea. So my two of my patients, they are like, uh, they are literally suffering. Like uh, it's very something very prominent for them. Though I don't see too much of difference. But do I have an alternative or I need to convince them ki, okay, continue hydroxyurea, this will rain off maybe when I come down on the dose. So are these female patients? Males. And how old are they? Like in their 50s, late 40s. I would switch them to interferon if they're not liking the way their skin looks. I mean, with the data, especially for the younger patient, I think it's a good reason to switch because they are having hyperpigmentation. It's, it's noticeable to them. You know, even if it's not noticeable to the doctor, it can be an issue for the patient. Just switch him. And even the wife, she's like, oh, why he's getting so dark? And that's a valid concern, right? It's like it's like with imatinib, they become, they white. get vitiligo. Exactly, they get white. So <laughs> it's interesting, actually. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, actually. We'll go to an audience question. Dr. Sumit wants to know, are there patients where you replace saline for the phlebotomy isovolumic. I do, especially if they are having orthostasis, dizziness, low blood pressure. 
I kind of do normal saline. So if they're removing 500 cc, which is the standard, we give 500 cc back. Thank or I cut down their phlebotomy. I give them, I do smaller ones, 250 cc at each time. Dr. Yoga Lakshmi, your question. Thank you for the excellent lecture, ma'am. Actually, my first question is an uh, extension of uh, Dr. Uh, Rajan sir's question. Uh, we have a PM of patient, 70 years old, and he's in blast phase now. And he's not eligible for transplant, and his NGS shows ASXL1 mutation and TP53 mutation. So, which will be the best modality of treatment? Because considering hypomethylating agents alone uh, and the hypomethylating agents plus venetoclax, both have only the CR rates differ, but the overall survival is similar in both the cases. Uh, so, which will be the best modality of treatment? The, even though the overall survival is not different, I would still go with the HNA then because uh, if, if your patient achieves CR, the quality of life will be improved. So even though you're not adding years, you're adding life to the years, uh, to the months. I shouldn't even say years for a blast phase MPN. Sorry about that. So I think for even so for that reason, I would go with the HMA when treatment, because if you render your patient transfusion independent, if you make his counts improved, at least he'd have a few uh, good months with his family. And if you keep him on the HMA alone, um, they're not going to even achieve that. They're going to continue to need transfusions. You need periodic follow-up. Risk for infection is higher. So quite a few things. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, so my second question is, uh, we have a patient diagnosed with polycythemia vera uh, in his 40, when he was 40 years old. And uh, two weeks was phlebotomy and aspirin. After 10 years, now he's 50 years and had developed a somigaly leukocytosis with left shift and basophilia. Uh, when we did the marrow, it was consistent with the initially a diagnosis negative. So how to approach this patient? I think you were cutting out. Did you did you, Agarwal? Did you Dr. Agarwal? No, you Yoga Lakshmi, we could not hear you. Can you type your uh, question? Uh, ma'am, we have yes, ma'am. I'll can I repeat my question? Okay, go ahead and repeat quickly. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, no, we still have problem. I think you type it out, okay? You can email me. I can put my email in the chat box. So for all the people who I'm not able to get to, just email me your questions. That way you don't feel left out. Right. Uh, okay. The next question from the audience is related to if there is a splenomegaly in a case of myelofibrosis, is the dose of stem cell higher? Not necessarily. I think we try to optimize the spleen before the transplant. You know, every uh, transplant doctor has a different threshold, every center. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that the dose infused of the stem cell is higher, even though I'm not personally a transplant doctor. So I don't want to misspeak, but I haven't heard so. Okay, and a connected question is, do you consider splenectomy before transplant? In some situations, unfortunately, yes. If the splenomegaly is massive and none of the medicines have worked, I usually don't do spleen radiation. It's kind of gone out of favor unless you're just trying to palliate somebody who's very moribund. Splenectomy is still a pretty useful mortality, modality. Over the last year, I've had two patients who successfully had splenectomy and improved their quality of life immensely. Thank you. Ria, your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Excellent talk, uh, Dr. Naseema. I have two to three questions, uh, short ones. Uh, similar to the cases presented, a patient with accelerated phase, uh, the blast percentage between 7 to 11%, uh, would azacitidine and ruxolitinib be a better combination? Not necessarily. Accelerated phase, once again, is a little bit better than blast phase, but transplant. In fact, there's data to transplant them even without reducing their blast. You know, so if you don't necessarily have to bring their blast to less than 5% or 10%. You could directly transplant them as well. Um, I think if you are going to try to attempt to reduce the blast, I would use HMA Ven over HMA Ruxo, unless you are trying to palliate some symptoms like big spleen or constitutional symptoms. Yes. So not not eligible for transplant at all. Oh, Around 70 transplant. year old, yes. Multiple comorbidities. So what should I continue him on? As a ruxolitinib or? 
I would just do it. Is he on ruxolitinib or you were going to add it? He was already on ruxolitinib. He progressed on that. So I think I would just do a uh, right HMA alone with the ruxolitinib. You know, if he's already progressed on the ruxolitinib, is there a reason to continue that, you think? What was the progression? You mean, what did this, the, what, the counts you mean? The counts are still high. They're around 20, 25,000. And uh, is the AXXL1 is positive. He's got high risk cytogenetic. So kind of patient, I would just kind of monitor because you are, he's not transplant eligible, right? No, so, not at all. So even if you put him on the HMA, what are we going to achieve? You can, he's not, the leukocytosis is modest. It's 22,000, you said? Yes. You can do hydrea. The, well. the blasts are 7 to 11 percent. Blast percentage is I mean, very the high. The blasts fluctuate in these patients. These MPN patients, I, it doesn't worry me if you ask me. I would probably just do like, how old is he? 78. Yeah, so he's very frail. I would just do hydrea uh, for, to control the leukocytos and the blast. I've had good luck even bringing the blast down with hydrea. And be careful with the combination that the platelets don't drop too much with the ruxohydrea combination. And I would use the HMA for later when you think you're not able to control the leukocytosis. Okay. Yeah, because Understood. 78, I think he's probably quite elderly. And I know in India, 70, most 78 year olds are not very up and about and everything, right? Right, right. That's very true. Now, one more thing. Uh, we have easy access to NGS now. So you still recommend we should do the jack by a allele-based PCR and then if it's negative, we follow that by NGS. Exactly. NGS alone would not do. It depends on the sensitivity of the NGS, but even at Mayo, we do the allele-specific PCR for the JAK2V617F because that's more sensitive than the NGS testing that's available. Okay. Uh, quick third question. Uh, a patient with secondary erythrocytosis uh, posted for a surgery, secondary to maybe a cyanotic heart disease. Uh, is there any cutoff for a pre-op uh, hematocrit? Suppose the patient is posted for a cardiac surgery. Uh, you said otherwise phlebotomy would not be indicated, but if the patient no, is posted for, off, surgery, for surgery, I think below 50 is a good, decent one. But some of these cyanotic heart disease patients have very high hematocrit, like even up to 60. So even it depends, you know, just bring it down. If he's around 60, then bring it to 55 and below. If he's 55, bring him to 50 and below. Okay. Understood. Yeah. But not uh, because he may need that high hematocrit. Yeah. Compensate. Understood. Uh, now, last question, madam, uh, regarding rusfatide, uh, the hepcidin mimetic, uh, are there any major cardio uh, uh, cardiac toxicities to be worried about? Like I was going to that trial some time back. Any thrombotic or cardiovascular? No. Not to my knowledge. I think it's relatively safe drug. The only question becomes uh, if you, if for the low risk patients, if there's a role for Pegasus, do we need to do two things? You know, if there's a role for the Ropeg or the interferon, then you could say, well, that's going to also make you phlebotomy free and potentially modify your disease. Do you need the rusfertide? So I think that's where the rusfertide may have a difficulty in having a role, but there is, I don't think toxicity wise, there's a concern. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We Thank got you. to learn a lot. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dia. Uh, one question from the audience. Uh, like peg interferon, is ropeg interferon safe in pregnancy? Yes, ropeg interferon is safe as well. I have to yet to use it on a patient, though. I must say that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Giri Puja. Uh, unmute yourself. Hi, ma'am. Uh, uh, my doubt is like uh, a newly diagnosed case of PV around 65 year old. If his MCV is very high, like 128, 130, and his B12 is low, what do we do? Like, uh, do you suggest to give B12? But then the hemoglobin will shoot up, hematocrit will shoot up. In I think that I would first manage the hematocrit, get the hematocrit under control. And then if he's still B12 deficient, I would give the B12. We'll okay. go ahead and give the doses because he's more prone to get like neurological symptoms also. Exactly, because there's probably, there could be precious anemia, something going on why they're B12 deficient, right? So there's no absolute contraindication, even for iron replacement in PV. It's relatively mm -hmm. contraindicated, but we do it case by case. As long as you're controlling the hematocrit, you can even give IV iron to these patients. Okay. And one more thing is the JAK2 mutation, uh, like heterozygous mutations and homozygous, ma'am. Like, is there any difference in outcome between the patients 
like who have homozygous mutations or heterozygous do like relatively better than homozygous not necessarily i mean i think if they are mutated they are at higher risk of for thrombotic complications in MPN, but I don't necessarily think it makes a big difference. Heterozygous doesn't mean that it is milder type or anything like that. No, it okay. doesn't have any prognostic relevance on its own. Okay, okay. And one more thing is, ma'am, in that first trial, you mentioned like molecular response, right? Uh, for the PV, the first trial, like we know that hematological response, I think we check it after one month, one year of therapy, like hydroxyurea or ROPEG interferon. This molecular therapy, what is the time period uh, it has to be I checked? I have been checking the PCR every year, like annually for these patients on interferon mm -hmm. to kind of see if the allele burden is going down. Okay, So start after first year of therapy, you're yes. saying after one year of therapy. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sushil, your question. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, thanks for that uh, very accessible talk, uh, Dr. Nasim. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, so uh, I had uh, a few questions. The first one was whether you're doing uh, germline testing in your uh, young uh, MPN patients. Not necessarily, unless there is a big family history that's concerning. I have not been routinely testing, but there could be a role, you know, depending on what you're selecting as the donor, if you're sending your patient to transplant but it's not a very well-established role for germline testing. So okay. I think so for AMN, a... we do have very set criteria if they have you know, certain mutations like GATA, RUNX. You know. for, for MPN, I mean, it depends. If there's a very strong convincing family history, then I do. But typically, I, I just assume they're sporadic cases. Sure. Fair enough. Uh, the, the second question is, uh, when would when do you stop the ruxolotinib uh, pre-transplant when you're, uh, like, like the pre-transplant uh, ruxolotinib? How are you switching off the ruxolotinib exactly, at Neo? I just, I, I just kind of taper it off like right before the transplant, so I don't stop it like many months before. And then they have the transplant, and depending on when they have engrafted, then we sometimes it started back up after a yeah, post-transplant as well. Okay, so okay. I have not so, been so that Okay, the transition is managed by another team, is it? Or... Yes, we have a transplant team here, so we kind of operate in separate, but we are very closely, we, we talk very closely. So they don't take our patient until they're ready for the transplant. So you're right, ah. we, I usually will start tapering them and we'll tell them, hey, stop it like maybe a week before the conditioning chemo, right? So it's not okay. like a big washout or anything. Sure. And uh, the last thing is actually this interesting case that came up uh, here. Uh, so we had this uh, a 70 year old man who uh, had a presentation of uh, anemia with uh, mild uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, leuco, uh, actually normal counts around 8000, but a massive spleen at presentation. It was very much like, uh, I mean, an, an MPN on the, with a leucoerythroplastic blood picture and uh, the large spleen. So uh, the MPN uh, allele specific PP, uh, PCR that we did uh, picked up a Calar mutation, uh, but when the when we sent the NGS, actually there was uh, and we had also sent a BCR ABL uh, RT PCR as which is part of our workup. Uh, the BCR ABL RT PCR also came positive. So essentially, the patient had uh, I mean, and there was on the morphology on the marrow there was uh, uh, features of a primary myelofibrosis. I mean, which I mean could be shared from the uh, CML also. So uh, we were confused on, I mean, there's only few case reports on this. So we're wondering whether you had come across anything like that in your experience. I have actually come across patients who had a, like an a MF and then acquired a BCR able, but not somebody who's diagnosed like that. But I think what I would do is I would treat the CML part because that's the easy part to treat, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have very specific treatment for it and then kind of see after you treat the CML part, how the counts do, how the spleen does, and then decide about the, MF treatment, you know. Okay, so you wouldn't give uh, concomitant uh, TKI and ruxolotinib in that sense. No, uh, I wouldn't. Yeah, I would, because that's at this point, because experience. Because, no, I wouldn't do the concomitant because I at this point I don't know how much of the spleen is coming from the CML versus MPN because Calar mutated MPN is relatively, you know, good risk MPN, right? Uh, depending mm -hmm. on the Calar, is it a type one Calar? Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we've, uh, I mean, we've sent it for, I'm mean, waiting the NGS on the myeloid panel to let us know more okay, details. The VAF, we're waiting for all the the allele frequency, all that, uh, that will give us more data, I suppose. But. So in my opinion, I would treat the CML first. I wouldn't do concomitant treatment and then see uh, how the symptoms are doing and then decide once you have the CML under control about treating the myelofibrosis part. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sushil. Dr. Rama, your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, that was a very nice talk, ma'am, with uh, updated current therapies. Uh, I would like to know, uh, is there any targeted therapy for JAK2 Exxon 12? Uh, this ruxolitinib we are giving for JAK2 V617F, right? So will that work with Exxon 12 mutation as well? It works for both. It's not V617F specific. It's against JAK2 itself. So we don't we don't have a very specific treatment for the V six one seven F. That is why the problem with all the side effects, you know. So so all these Jack inhibitors they are Jack two inhibitors. So they will work for both all kinds of Jack two mutations. Okay. Okay. And uh, will you treat the post PV or ET related MF and uh, primary MF similarly, or is there any difference? Similarly. You can use the same prognostication. You apply the same principles. Same treatment as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, I want to like to know, how do you approach or manage the patients with MP and NVOS? Uh, because there will be so much of overlapping going on. So will the how you're going to treat them? Depend on what the major problem is. Once again, we'll go systematically. Is anemia the problem? Is the spleen the problem? And we're just going to borrow treatments from, you know, if erythrocytosis is the problem. Okay. Okay. So based symptomatically, you're going to treat this ambient uh, NVOS patients. Yeah. Uh, I have to head to the hospital as well. So I don't know how many questions there are. Um, Dr. Nasim, it's fine. The questions will be endless. Yes, yeah, so I left my email on there. If you can email them, I will get to these. How long we need to continue anticoagulation for splenic vein thrombosis is indefinite anticoagulation. And ruxolotinib and triple negative MPN, what's your practice? Yes, it works for all MPN because we haven't identified mutations for the triple negative patients, but we know that there's disordered jack stat signaling. So the JAK inhibitors work for even triple negative MPN. We don't have a very specific uh, epitope for that. And calrotinib and MPL, uh, the targeted approved, FDA approved targeted therapies are there, ma'am? No, for cal reticulin, there is a monoclonal antibody, which is going to be entering clinical trials. But for MIPL, there is no particular specific treatment. Okay, but there's no FDA treatment. So we use the JAK inhibitors for all of the MPMs. I think we'll okay. start. Thank, Thank you so you much. Very, Thank you very much, Dr. Naseema, for sparing so much time. You have been very patient. And in the beginning, also we messed up your timing. So no, and, sorry, sorry. Yeah. If I didn't have to run to the hospital, I would I would answer all of you. I see lots of hands up there, and hopefully you got my email in the chat box. Please send me an email. I'm happy to respond to each one of you because I don't want disappointed hands who kept waiting right all this time. Thank you, and thanks to all the discussions. Thanks to the sponsors. Thanks to the event management team. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening with your family. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you.